Hey there, everyone. This is Monica, and welcome to episode 21 of pre Cana with the Pope. In today's episode, Renzo and I are thrilled to sit down and chat with Lisa Cotter. We discuss her new book, Reveal the Gift, which takes a deep dive into the feminine genius. We talk about how the feminine genius can help reframe how we understand our Catholic faith, what it means to live from our feminine genius, and how husbands can support their wife's feminine genius. We're so happy you're here with us. Let's jump in. everyone. So we have um, a new adventure this week on our podcast. Um, we have our first guest and we're so glad to have her. Um, we have Miss Lisa Cotter. Um, she just recently released a book on the feminine genius and um, I snagged it immediately because I was like, oh my goodness, between this ministry and youth ministry, like I, we need more information on this. We need to, we need to know how to live in the feminine genius and and um i've had the the privilege of following her on social media for a while and i just knew she would be the right woman to say the right stuff so um i was not wrong when i read the book and then mm-hmm. um we just got connected and we're so happy to have her join us tonight to share about um the feminine genius in marriage in particular um but before we get there we should get to know her a little bit and and have you get to know her a little bit Oh, you mean them? Them. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I thought you were well, me. you as well. But I guess. Yeah. No, I read the I read the book too. Um, <laughs> but uh, Lisa, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself um, and just yeah, introduce yourself to the audience and anything that we should know. Yeah. So uh, my name is Lisa Cotter, as you've obviously said, and I'm here in Denver, Colorado, with my husband and we have, and four kids. So we're going to be 17 years this summer married. Wow. So. Yeah, we got married when we were like 12. Um, <laughs> I was actually 21, but it, like, it's crazy to be, I, I'm 38, but I have almost 16 year old, right? So it's kind of crazy. Yeah, wow. um, so yeah, pretty crazy. So very exciting, um, exciting time in life. So our kids range from, yeah, 16 in July. So just less than a month, she'll be 16. And then our baby is three. And we have been in full-time ministry our whole marriage. Um, we went from focus. We did 11 years in focus as focus missionaries, which was fantastic. And really kind of how I got started in doing what I'm doing. It was um, in those early years of focus at the conferences, they just needed staff members to give talks. <laughs> and so you would submit like a proposal and then they would give you I think it was like $35 to give the talk. <laughs> it was great. like this major, un- yeah, major undertaking. I-, I remember one conference I spoke um, two times to uh, groups of like 600 back to back and we got like a $70 check. And because we were at this conference center, we like spent it all on dinner that yeah. night. You know, it was yeah. like, go out and we weren't being extravagant. Yeah, we weren't even being extravagant. It was just like, we're at a hotel in a conference center. <laughs> There's This is it. So kind of some funny, humble beginnings, things that I never, I guess it's not really a humble beginning. It was pretty cool to get to start that way. Um, But I never imagined that this is what God was going to call me to, Mm. right? I thought, you know, oh, we're going to get married. We're going to have kids and we're going to, I don't know, do ministry. We homeschooled for a while, you know, just never imagined that that God would call me one day to speak and to write. Uh, But here we are. Here we are um, years later. Yeah. And just had my second book come so out, which is so fun. And so now you are both focused yeah. missionaries, you and your husband? Mm, that's always a fun question. So technically, <laughs> I was not a missionary. So when we got married, um, we went to first to grad school. Kevin was in the first graduate class at the Augustine okay. Institute, oh, cool. if you're familiar with the Augustine Institute. Yeah, and I worked there. And so um, we had our daughter while he was in grad school. And then we joined Focus. So I already had, you know, we already had a baby. Mm-hmm. So it didn't really make a lot of sense for us to like, I couldn't really live the life of a missionary. Um, but over the years, over those 11 years, I did a lot of um, kind of like side projects for Focus. So I was the uh, family liaison uh, for a while, which was really fun, which was a job I created for myself. It started out as a volunteer position. And they were like, that's what you do. Um, we actually don't want you to stop doing that. Yeah. Right. I just like, there was a need, right. We had wives, we were getting more and more wives and we were all over the country. And I, I you can kind of liken to the life of a focused family a, a little bit. And I don't, I hope this isn't like offensive to military families, but in a sense, there's like a military aspect yeah. to it. And that, 
focus will kind of send you wherever yeah. and you just have to be ready to move and you might move frequently and you're not around family. And so your focus community has to kind of become your community. And so you see each other at big events and you see each other at new staff training in the summer, which is when all the missionaries mm -hmm. gather to get trained. Right. And so that was kind of one of my jobs was, okay, let's bring all the wives together. So I put out a newsletter. And then when we had conferences, we had like a wives lunch and we would do a speaker and just kind of try to do something to honor the wives yeah. for yeah. the sacrifice they were making, not in physical combat, but spiritual combat, really. Yeah. You know, that's what um, for many of us, our husbands were entering into. And some of the wives were working as well. Um, it wasn't, you know, an exclusive thing, like only women can work for focus, but or only men, sorry. Um, but it just tended to be, you know, the life of a missionary as a mom isn't super practical, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> 9.30 Bible study at night, you know, like it's, it's a little hard when you've got a baby who's nursing. So, um, but yes, that, that's kind of uh, the focus story. So technically no, but I did get a paycheck totally and I, honorary you know, I've spoken at conferences. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Missionary to the missionaries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. In many yeah. ways, yeah, that is kind of the role of a focused wife. Like you like host dinners and um, the single female missionaries often, you know, are over at your house hanging out. It's it's great. It's a lot of fun. You kind of get to play a bit of the role of spiritual mothers sometimes, especially if you're more of a veteran yeah. missionary. Yeah. No. <laughs> those first years are coming did, in. Did that experience lead you to wanting to write books and speak? Yeah. So I think the speaking kind of started, I mean, it's interesting. It's kind of like a conglomeration of things. Some of it was on campus when we were at Benedictine. Um, I gave a couple of talks here oh, or there just to our post. students because, <laughs> yeah, it was, oh yeah, we were at Benedictine, um, which is where we graduated from. So it was really fun That's to so come cool. back. Um, yeah, it was, it was super great. I loved it. I would have stayed for years and years and years, but Kevin got an opportunity at headquarters, um, to direct their curriculum. Well, to write for the curriculum department. Eventually he was the director of curriculum for, um, a season. Um, but, um, so speaking and writing. So it was Seek 2013, which is their big, you know, conference for everybody. And they called me up and said, Lisa, can you give a talk on, authentic femininity to just everyone at seek or all the, all the women. And I was like, you know me, like, why would you ask me to do that? Like, I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what this femininity thing is supposed to look like. I'm flailing. I'm, I'm failing. Like I'm a little afraid of what the church is going to tell me I'm supposed to be as a woman because I've heard some rumors and, um, I don't, I don't know. Rumors on both sides of, you know, like some rumors that was like to be a woman is like, this and then another extreme. No, no, no. Be a Catholic woman is this. And I didn't feel like I connected with either of those fully. And so, um, so I gave that, that talk. I, I said yes, because, um, I think, I think I felt like, you know, if, uh, if there's one thing I'm going to try to understand about myself, like being a woman's probably a, a good thing because I'm going to be this for the rest of my life. And so maybe I should spend some time to figure this out. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I was like, okay, I'm going to stop being afraid of the church um, and what they say. So I dove in, obviously found relief, found some amazing, um, beautiful answers, found some peace to my own heart of of realizing like, oh, this is what the church says. And it's it's actually beautiful and I can get behind it. And so um gave that talk and that was 10 years mm -hmm. ago, over 10, over 10 years ago. Oh, no, right around 10 <laughs> Doesn't even matter. Um, but I wanted to write this book for a long time and I was just waiting for a prompting of the Holy Spirit. And then in, in the interim, we, my husband and I, well, I'll be honest, I wrote Dating Detox. We put his name on it because Jason Everett told us to do that so men would feel comfortable <laughs> holding it. Right. Um, I was like, okay, Jason, you're the pro. Yeah. I'll do whatever you say. <laughs> so he wrote like two chapters of the 40, right? Um, but I still, still super, I mean, he read through everything and, you know, kind of was like, oh, let's like soften this for the men or let's, you know, not say it quite like that. Um, so they can kind of identify mm -hmm. with, with that aspect as well or whatever it was. Um, but I could, I don't think I could have known when I, so I started writing the book before COVID mm -hmm. and then, um, I kind of paused just because, COVID, right? Everybody was like, what is yeah. happening? What are we supposed to be doing? Like, you know, your brain, it just was not the time to sit and write. And then I picked it back up about a year ago. Yeah, just, well, probably like a year and a half ago. And um, 
finished it, but I don't think I could have known that when my book finally came out that we would be where mm. we're at in society in terms of the conversations we're now having about gender to such a strong mm-hmm. degree. But like not only on – on the secular side, but even on the Catholic side, there's like a whole new conversation that's recently come up about what is the role of a woman? What is the role of a wife yes. and a mother? And um, it's just been very interesting, yes. right? <laughs> and like here my book like drops in the middle of all this and it's like, um, okay, I guess we're going there. I guess we're – yeah, I guess this is – what the Lord right. wanted. So I'm glad I, I'm glad I'm glad that it came. I feel like when it was supposed to come out. Um, but it wasn't supposed to be an answer or a reputation to either side of the aisle there. It just was supposed to be a book on what JP2 wrote and, and a book for all women to be able to to read no matter what stage of life you're in and feel like, okay, okay, there there's something unique and precious um precious is maybe a bad word um but unique about being a woman that the world mm-hmm. needs mm-hmm. right jp2 called it vitally essential this this feminine genius that we have so absolutely that's yeah so we love that you used obviously so much jp2 because um he's inspired our podcast and um and i would love if you could dive into a little bit more about you kind of mentioned too how this like wrestling with your identity as a woman even started before this invitation to speak and it started in middle school you 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 said in the book um and the implications of genesis you had like wrestling and anxiety regarding the implications (laughs) of genesis how did jp2 and the feminine genius come to like reframe that worry and like also for because of our listeners like we have we've worked with teens and also with engaged couples married couples like newlyweds Mm -hmm. and that that like a lot of them haven't worked through that middle school uh, tension that they had. They still kind of carry it. Um, and I just think that, that yeah. your, your book is just one that can really just reframe everything yeah. and really shed light on, on mm-hmm. what the church wants to teach and wants to give to us, to us. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, it's so interesting. Um, this isn't something that I put in the book because I didn't want to come across in a negative way. But I think the vast majority of those listening are probably Catholic here. Um, and so, you know, there's an interesting thing about America that I, I'm, and I, I love so many Protestants, right? But like, there's a big difference between the way Catholics see the world and Protestants yes. see the world. When you really start to understand our visions, mm-hmm. right? And so I think that sometimes we don't recognize like how shaped our world has been by the Protestant world because that was what we were founded on was Protestant mm-hmm. principles, right? And so I think that we've had this kind of thread of understanding of well, what makes a woman that's that's like kind of been a, a global American culture thing that's actually like a Protestant culture thing and not actually mm-hmm. a Catholic culture thing. And so I growing up, I think had a lot of influences um, on what it meant to be a woman that um, – of course, we're coming, you know, from society, but also coming from what I thought the church taught, which was actually, I think, more so akin to what a lot of Protestant mm-hmm. churches um, kind of on the very conservative mm-hmm. side would teach. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I thought, like, okay, so as a woman, I'm supposed to be this in this tight little box. Um, and I didn't quite... Um, know that the church actually had like this whole teaching on what it means to be a woman. (laughs) I didn't know it existed. And so I was like framing my worldview on something that I thought was church, but it wasn't Catholic church. Does that make sense? So like, it's like this weird balance, right? Like, so you have in the eighties and nineties, and I think still to today and in many, many ways where like to be a woman in the eighties and nineties, which is what I grew up in was like, you assert yourself like a man, right? Like, Feminine gifts, those are weak. Those are pointless. They're not very helpful. They're not going to move the margin or move the needle forward. So we need women to like become the boss witch. Um, we'll yeah. just trade out a letter, <laughs> right? And like just get trash done and suppress your emotions and like run people over and stop being so sensitive, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, like sensitive in the sense of like, oh, that, that would really hurt that person if mm. I did that. It's like, no, no, climb the ladder. Yeah. Like, forget it. Forget about them. You do what you need to do for you, right? You're, you're number one. And that's just not something that's like innate, I don't think, as much to women. Like we naturally nurture. We naturally mother, whether that be physically, whether that be spiritually. Like it's just we see people as people. John Paul II talks about that a lot. Like there's this uniqueness in the way that we see people as people, right? So um, sorry. I feel like I'm jumping all around here. This is is gold. (laughs) Okay. 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 So 
So I had in this mind, like, one idea was like, okay, well, I'm so to be a woman means I assert myself like a man. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So I'm just supposed to hate pink and glittery things and girly things, right? And, but then I also saw, like, but when I look at, like, church stuff, right, there wasn't a whole lot of Catholic books mm-hmm. and things coming out when I was a kid. Like, there wasn't a whole, especially, like, on dating mm-hmm. and relationships. Like, we went to the Protestants for all our cues, you know? And some of the stuff they say is really great. Some of it's, like, not a Catholic right, view, right. <laughs> like some of the approach, you know? Um, and so, but same thing then with femininity. And I was like, oh, so to be a woman, and now I'm saying like, oh, this is emphatically everybody who's a Protestant. No, but like, I would see these visions of like, well, you're supposed to wear like long skirts and love to bake and love babies and be like so flowery and feminine. And I didn't, I didn't really like relate yeah. to that. And maybe that was a part of the society pushing me to say like, no, no, assert yourself like a man. I don't know. But so when I would hear things like Genesis <laughs> saying, so as a as a woman, you've been created to be the helpmate. I would just tense up and be like, yeah. no, no, that's – what? Like, God, you made me to, like, be man's helper? Like, are you serious? <laughs> like, that dorky kid sitting next to me in math class who is using his calculator to try to write inappropriate <laughs> words with letters, like – that's who I'm supposed to be the helpmate to? Like, you no, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> never, never. <laughs> never. Not you. You're so mature, oh, right? Yeah, sure. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. And so I was just, like, mortified. And I was like, well, I guess the, like, Christian version of a woman that I see is this, like, very feminine person. And so I guess that's what it's supposed to mean to be a woman. But I, I just – I felt torn in that because I was like, no, but I can do – really yeah. great things. I can I can contribute to the world in really amazing ways. And if my only job is just to be like the doormat of my husband or just to be like the secretary to my uh to the men in my life my whole life, I feel like I could do more. And there's nothing wrong with like being a secretary. That's beautiful. That's amazing to be in that like like so, total like service role. And actually I think so many executive assistants I'm like, uh these this company would fall yeah. apart without them. Absolutely. Right. Like they do so much more than they get credit for. Right. But I just I had this negative vision yeah. of this in my head because I was in junior high. Right. And so so like from the get go, I was kind of like, mm, I don't know about this. Right. And and there was a lot, I think, going on in the church at that time, too, of like a real push for like girls were just being allowed to be altar servers when I was a kid. That was a big thing, mm. you know, and it was kind of like, see, they're starting to like yeah. recognize <laughs> that you can do things, too. And it's like, oh. Okay, like I was a female altar server as a kid and it felt weird, I'll be honest. I didn't like it after like a year. I was like, mom, I don't want to do that. Like I don't – I couldn't explain it. I couldn't put my finger on it. But it just was like – I don't know. I don't want to do that, mom. Um, even though like here I've been liberated, yeah. right? So <laughs> um, that was my experience. Maybe not other women. Maybe other women. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not judging right there. Um, that one's that one's beyond me. Um, just me personally. Didn't feel right. So yeah, I just I, – I kind of – came in with this prejudice that I brought with me. And then when I started to get more into my faith, I thought, okay, well, I guess I just have to accept this and I have to figure out like how to be happy in this. I guess this is how you be happy. You know, you just try to fit this mold. And, and I, you know, I was told like, oh, this is what is going to bring you to happiness. But it was like this tight little itty bitty box that made me feel as if I even had to have like the right Catholic jewelry and, and know who to follow on social media that fit that mold. Yeah. And, you know, like, and if I didn't know these, these books or these authors or these speakers, like mm. I was failing because I wasn't, I wasn't trending, mm. you know, with everything that was going on in the Catholic world correctly. And so, um, that's kind of where I found myself when, you know, and being in focus too, right. You're privy to like all the yeah. trends because that's right. your whole world working with yeah. college students, right? They always know what's going on. Uh, high schoolers too, I'm sure. Yeah. The high schoolers, you probably know. Yeah. They know what's going on too. Like who's the cool TikTok Catholic kids. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I don't know. Well, and um, like, that's what I loved about your book is that it's not just like a, it's not a response to the culture Yes. in like how it's not a book of like, oh, well, the culture is going this direction that you have to come back to this. Um, I think it actually acknowledges that the culture is mm. responding it, the, the way the culture is going is a symptom of, of, of just not understanding the, the full truth. And I think your, your book really is like, is, I don't want to say it's like, it's another way, but like it, it really just, it acknowledges both sides yeah. and then, in, and then it provides something mm-hmm. different. And like, what, mm-hmm. what was it putting, like putting that together? Like, what was the, what were the highlights of putting that together? What were the low lights of putting that together? Cause I, cause it sounds like, it, <laughs> yeah. like an impossible task and you put it in a very concise book. So. 
that that was a thank you oh you know i so i started speaking on it right 2010 was my first like go at it and i look back on that talk which has been viewed like tens of thousands of times and is a cd and sometimes i'm like that wasn't quite right like dang it (laughs) (laughs) but like I, I've heard a priest tell me, he's like, you know, Lisa, like, you just, you can't live in that. Like, priests have to give homilies mm-hmm. every week. We're not always going to, you know, we're we're going to grow and develop, but you have to trust that the Holy Spirit's going to move in that. You prayerfully prepared, you know, you did all that you could. And it's not like anything in there is heretical, you know, but I'm like, oh, I could have explained mm-hmm. that better. And now I will, you know. Um, so, so I started with that. And then obviously just, I mean, so many conversations with women working in ministry and focus, you know, you're constantly talking to college students, recent college grads about their experiences and just learning and gathering from that. And then when I, um, so I'm actually working on my master's at the Augusta Institute. So I'm uh, starting my sixth year next yeah. year. So <laughs> my two year, yeah, two year program. Just fin- he just I graduated. Just, I just finished. <laughs> yeah. I also you. just finished this in my sixth year, a two year program. <laughs> Oh, I wish I could oh, give you like a high yes. five through the screen here. <laughs> so That's hard. amazing. Yeah. And it's kind of, you just you just do it, you know, like you just take the steps. Um, so the AI, you know, I was like I said, I was working there. Um, did I say that? I was working there when they opened their doors. Um, I was the only full time employee at the AI. Um, and so I have a long, long history with them. So they've been really good to me um, and just helping me also kind of pursue some passions. And so. Part of my study at the AI, I did an independent study on the feminine genius. I just created it. I was like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read through all these these books, all these documents. And then I just worked in. I had like this women's retreat I was doing, and it was like a four-talk retreat. So I recorded those as one of my papers. (laughs) And then – a chapter for a book that's finally coming out soon, but I cannot, it's not, it's not my book. I'm just a contributor to it um, on the feminine juice. So I was doing all these different projects. And so I, I just like brought it together. So I did a lot of studying for one semester. I just, I just read, I just read. I was like, try to figure this out. Try to figure this out, Lisa. Like talk to some great professors. And then um, I also had a chance to take a course called women of the church. Yes. Women of the church, which highlighted women. It's so like the women of the French revolution. Like that was oh, all from yeah. that class, that chapter on the women of the French revolution. Yeah. I had no idea who they were before that class. You know, like I thought, yeah, Marie Antoinette, and <laughs> like, that's all the French revolution. Yes. Like, missed a little, little bit, right. Of the Catholic piece of it. Um, so, you know, so I, I studied a lot. I, um, talked a lot. I had some girls over to my house every week. Um, as I was starting to the writing process, this was all pre COVID. Um, I had, I had a small group of young adult women who would come over every Sunday. We, we started out, we did dating detox together, which was really fun. And then we did salvation history study together. And then I gave them this idea. I said, Hey, I'm thinking about this book. Can we just come and talk about these different gifts? And so we did basically, um, each of the gifts that are listed in the book. Um, and we can kind of maybe get into that a little bit, like what I mean by gifts, um, we took each one, one a week. And I just said, okay, here's some quotes I found on JP2 on this. And I just read them out. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, do you identify with this yeah. gift? Right? <laughs> we just had a conversation. Like, how does this gift, how does this gift become a struggle for you? Um, how does this gift, you know, what do you do when you struggle with this gift? And what's your experiences of this? And, and so that was also a huge part of research. So I, yeah, I don't write books just to write books. I actually don't consider mm-hmm. myself a writer. Like that's not like, if you ask my profession, I would never put down like on a census mm. writer, right? Like this, I wouldn't say that. Um, but I, I feel called to bring truth into the world and content mm. into the world. And this was a piece. If, if there's two things that I think that we get the most confused about in this world, it's dating mm. and gender. And so I wrote a book <laughs> on dating, dating detox. And then I wrote a book on, on authentic femininity. Cause I think if we can get those two things, right. Right. And this like totally plays into everything yeah. with marriage, yeah. like everything yeah. with marriage, right? Like if you can't, if you can get dating right before you get married and if you can understand your uniqueness as husband and wife, as male and female, it's going to solve so many issues that, that we struggle and fight with and, have baggage and drama through Absolutely. and so that's why i i, yeah. I loved, went for this I book i just loved even like you speaking and then reading reading the book how you pull together um the writings of jp2 which are like fabulous and then you pulled real mm. lived experience of women your own experience lives of the saints and and um future saints mm-hmm. and pulled that all together so that it was just this holistic picture of womanhood and mm-hmm. that like you said before fitting into boxes that like that is not 
spoiler alert, like that's not what the feminine genius is. <laughs> like it is not a box <laughs> meant to be fit mm. in, but mm-hmm. it's, it's something to be lived. It's a lived reality. And I just think that you did mm-hmm. like a masterful job of, of bringing in the misunderstanded mm-hmm. church teaching, clarified that in a way mm-hmm. that like was really easy for me, a non masters reader <laughs> to understand. Um, and then, yeah, just pulling in stories of, of, of real women. I think it was such a gift. Yeah. Like when we were talking mm-hmm. about it, I loved how the way you phrase it, like you, that you were um, living from your feminine genius, like, like not living out, but living from it. Mm-hmm. And I thought that that was so, mm-hmm. uh, you, do you want to explain that a little bit more? And then also like, while explaining what the feminine genius yeah. might be if, uh, for our listeners. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great question because there's confusion on it. What is the feminine genius? You know, I, I do this often when I give a talk. I'm like, we're talking about the feminine genius today. Who can define it for me? Everyone's like, yeah. mm. <laughs> Mm-mm. Like, don't, don't call on me. <laughs> like, I've heard it. I think I have like some general ideas, but I don't know. And part of the struggle is that JP2 never mm-hmm. defined it. <laughs> he never defined it. And I think what most people don't realize is that like he also didn't invent it. This wasn't a phrase that he came up with. People say, oh, he coined. And I'm like, he didn't yeah. coin it. Um, you know, he, it, this wasn't like a concept that he came up with himself. It actually, it, we don't know for sure, right? There wasn't you know, some author who was like, I am the feminine genius um, (laughs) expert or whatever, right? But in the 30s, even back in the 30s, there were German, female German philosophers who were writing and talking about this, this genius that is essentially woman. Um, So that'd be Gertrude Gertrude von Lefort um, in her book. Um, Oh, now I'm blanking on the name of the book. Oh, hold on. I think I've got it Um, written down here. Yeah, it just says Gertrude von Lefort. Um, So 1934. Um, she wrote a book. We'll put it in the show notes. How's that? I'll make sure. (laughs) We'll find it. Oh, it's going to drive me crazy. Eternal woman. I think it's eternal woman. Pretty sure. Confirm that. (laughs) Check the notes. (laughs) Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's eternal woman. So, and she would, she talked about this. And some people think that book's from 1954, but that's when it was translated Mm -hmm. to English. She actually wrote in 1934. And so JP too, like he was reading Edith Stein. Mm -hmm. Like he was you know, when you look at his Mulier Stigmatum, when you look at when he talks about femininity, you can see like, oh, he's he's read her. He is taking concepts from her. And so I imagine these people, these female philosophers in the 1930s probably mm-hmm. knew each other to some extent or were reading each other's writings. I can't mm-hmm. imagine them not. Like this is a right. niche community <laughs> here, right? So we've got like Gertrude and Edith, you know, having these conversations. So Edith doesn't use that phrase, but Gertrude did a couple times in her book. She talked about this. This genius is essentially woman. Okay, so what is it? I remember hearing it in college and thinking, oh, that just means women are really smart, <laughs> right? Like we're geniuses. We're brilliant, right? Um, or I remember thinking like, are you serious? Like don't pander mm-hmm. me. Like you don't need to come up with a special name for me to try to make me feel important because I can't, you know, have all the same – I don't know, like, because I'm not as important yeah. as man or something, you know, like I'm like J- the first, very first right. times I heard it. Right. I, th- I thought it was just JP2 trying to like placate women or something. Um, but here's, here's how I've come to understand it. So keeping in mind, right. JP2 never defined it. The church is never going to have a doctrine on this. There's never going to be a council that gathers together to talk about the feminine genius because this isn't the Trinity. It's not right. the incarnation. Mm-hmm. These aren't things that are like essential to our faith. Although sometimes yeah. we want them to be right. <laughs> so. Yeah, kind of how I break it down. I love the work of Sister Prudence Allen. Um, she is a religious sister, obviously, sister. She uh, wrote essay um, – sorry, not essays on woman. That would be E.S. Shine. Um, she wrote The Concept of Woman, and it's this three-volume, 2,000-page work. And in about page 1,990 is when she finally gets to John Paul II and the Feminine Genius. <laughs> so – she covers it all. I have not read this entire 2,000-volume series. I, I don't want to claim that at all. But – the way she explains it is she says this. She says the phrase genius of woman refers to a way of being, acting, and loving in the world, which manifests a unique creativity in human relationships, right? So it's not – the way I, – I wish I would have put this in the book. It's funny, too, as I do interviews. I'm like, oh, I, I should have done it that way. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Book's done. It's what it's supposed to be, right? Um, but Edith Stein will say, like, the world doesn't need what women have. It needs yeah. what women are. Like, that's what she's getting at, right? It's not like our gifts – like, are you, you know, like, oh, our specialness as women um, in that sense of, like, feminine gifts per se. It's a part of the genius. Absolutely. But I think the heart of it is it's our nature. 
it's who we are, right? It has to do with our way of being. It has to do with how we were created as women. And that manifests itself uniquely in our relationships. So the way I define it in the book, to sum it up, is it's this person-oriented nature of woman, right? It's this this person-focused disposition that we have as women that is written on our souls as, as men and women, right? Like we are made in the image of God who gives and receives, gives and receives, right? So it's written on human souls, but in a unique way, it's revealed through our bodies as women in the sense that in the way that we are created to, to mother and to mm-hmm. receive, like that's written on our very body. And so that says something about our nature and who we are and what we bring into this world, right? So the way I would say it is, Okay, so we have this nature, right? So this is how we like, we live from our genius, meaning like we live from our nature, yeah. our feminine nature. And then because we have this feminine nature, God has bestowed on women these gifts that are like necessary to do what mm-hmm. we are called to do as women. We are called to uniquely do as women. And it's not that these gifts are exclusive. I think this was a huge light bulb for me when I found this out because I remember reading Theology of the Body and thinking, okay, so men are like givers, full stop. Women are receivers, full stop. And I have to stay in that lane and I'm not allowed to give, right? Or like men are protectors, full stop. So I can't be a protector as a woman because that's his role, right? When in reality, Benedict the 16th talked about it this way, um, in collaboration of men and women, um, <laughs> and then there's more words. I don't know. It's a really long title. Um, great document. Everybody should read it, right? But he talks about how Men and women, how, he gives these ideas of like all these gifts that women, right, like, like bring into this world. And he says, but above all, we must remember these are human gifts. And he says that it's only because women are the privileged sign of these gifts that we see them mm-hmm. like lived out in this mm-hmm. unique way, right? So, so it's that we're each called to, to give, we're each called to receive, right? But women have like this naturalness to receiving about them. So we are the privileged mm-hmm. sign of it. So we're supposed to bring this gift into the world and model it to the men in our lives who are also called to give because these right. are human gifts or to receive, sorry. Um, but like we are the ones who like more have a more like a, um, a, a um, what's the right word, an inclination to it. And so we are the ones who who model that for the men eyes. And then men have these unique gifts, right, too, that they have been kind of written on them and that they manifest uniquely that they're called to model to the women in their lives, right? So it's not like men and women are pitted against each other. And it's like, here's here's man, call him A, here's woman, call him B, don't stray. But like, no, 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 we're called to be human, yeah. right? JP2 says like when we live from these things, the human finds full realization, right? I can't understand who I am apart from man. And man can't understand who I am apart from, from woman. We need right. each other to fully understand who we are created to be. And when we live from that, that's when we find full realization. And I think what I was raised in was like this pitting of men against women, right? Like men are the enemies. They're the bad guys. We need to like rise above them. We need to like outmen them, you know, (laughs) like outman them. Right. You know? And so it was like, oh, they were seen as enemies as opposed to no, actually like when we work together, we help each other become more human. Like if, like his gifts are not like a threat to me, but like a compliment to me, right? Complimentary, big, big JP two words. A compliment to me that showed me and revealed to me more about who I am. So now, um, and so like one of my favorite parts of the book was your dedication. Cause I, I love the way you yeah. worded it that, that, um, oh, I wrote it down too. And I don't know where I put it, mm. but go to the beginning. I'm going to the beginning. <laughs> no, those are my notes. Oh, yeah. It's, I wrote, <laughs> <laughs> that you thank them for encouraging you to, to live from your feminine genius mm-hmm. and to her husband. She yeah. Yes, her yes, husband. yes. I know, well, that, that, yes. Mm-hmm. Sorry to husband, not JP2. Or sorry. Um, but Kevin. like, <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> sorry. But like, so how do you see this play out in marriages or how should this play out in marriages? One, like, how should, um, the, the wife kind of adopt this and, and, and live it out. And how do you see, a, uh, really integrating the feminine genius change how marriages, um, just function? Yeah. I think it's that recognition of, I have unique gifts that I have been given that like are more natural to me and you have unique gifts and neither one of us. So, so that means that neither one of us is always going to be the person mm. who's right. <laughs> right. Like sometimes I, I, this is going to be a place where I am going to just naturally be more prepared. Right. And there's going to be times where there's places where you're going to be more prepared. And I think understanding and knowing these, this uniqueness of how we are created in these gifts can relieve some tension when it comes to those arguments. Um, 
where it's like, oh, but but like I just always want to be right, right? There, there's a tendency in that. Um, I think for both men and women to like always want to be the one who knows the answer, always know the one to be right. Where sometimes I can step back and go, actually, my husband, like he's probably going to do a better job with this one. So I'm going to let him go first and and take the stab at it. And then I will follow up with however I think we could fill out this idea, this concept, this conversation, this discernment, whatever. And um, not be afraid, right? <laughs> like trusting yeah. in each other that this is not, this is your life and this is my life. But like, no, no, no. Like we're complimenting each other. Let's lean into that. Let me allow you to compliment me. Like I, I actually – there's going to be times, yeah, where I'm not going to be as strong in a certain area. And that's a good thing that you are. And I don't have to always know the answers. I don't always have to be right. And that's like part of the beauty of marriage is that, that, that working together where in that sense, like you're, you're not alone. Um, and I think that that is like such a relief to me. So there's times where like I had to let him just like do his thing and he just let me do my thing. Um, and of course we have conversations about tough decisions and things, but we have to lean on and trust each I other. Loved, in, in I love that gifts. example of the emergency that you gave. And I think you had taken it from somebody else's mm-hmm. story, but um, of how the, mm-hmm. the husband and wife, the mother and father responded differently to an emergency in their home. Um, and I yeah. think it speaks to the complementarity of the, the, so it was, um, I think it was, like somebody was coming into the house. Don't give it away. Don't give it away. You got to buy the book. Sorry, got to buy, buy the book if you want to hear the story. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyways, <laughs> oh, but I feel, like, so I, I feel like yeah. I've seen examples mm-hmm. of that in our life where like we would respond differently mm-hmm. in the same situation. And sometimes we defer mm-hmm. to the other because their naturalness in that situation is actually where we should be leaning. And then sometimes it's because we both respond differently that the, the whole picture mm-hmm. is probably the way it was meant to be because we both collaborated because we both worked together. Have you seen that happen in your marriage? Yeah. Like with, with Kevin and raising the kids and moving around to different places, yeah. like all these adventures that you guys have been on. Have you seen that live well in your marriage? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, the one I, I always think of first is like house hunting for us, right? Like I go into house and like my heart immediately starts to move in yeah. and I start to get emotional about the house and I start to pick out whose bedroom is going to be where. And, and it's a, it's like, that's a beautiful thing that like my, my heart like wants to make space for people and wants to people first, right? I'm thinking mm. about people, right? That's, that's my natural inclination is where are we going to fit into this home? Whereas Kevin comes in and he's like, Okay, financially, mm. like, is this place su- structured yeah. well? Is it sound? Is this a good place to purchase? Or are we going to end up in a money mm. pit? Right. So he's seeing it like with a different lens. And so sometimes, yeah, we would kind of, it'd be easy to get really tense about house hunting. Um, we've bought three houses because we've moved quite oh. a few times over, the, over the years. Right. And so I will go in a house and Kevin has to remind me, like, we're not buying it because you saw it for five <laughs> minutes. Like, we're going to sleep on it. Like, we're going to like, we're going to do the inspection, like hold on loosely, yeah. right? And so there's that that balance there, which is a good thing because my first thought is not, how's the foundation? <laughs> like, I don't care about the foundation. We can <laughs> fix it, right? Like, well, maybe, but we don't have, you know, that to cost $20,000 more. No, we can't right. fix it. So, um, so, you know, you see, you see that I think a lot. Um, and I think that the issue that we need to be careful with here is that we don't start putting that into stereotypes, yeah. mm-hmm. right? super important to recognize that that these are not meant to be stereotypes, right? These are gifts that we have, but the way we express them could be in a stereotypical way, or it could be in a pretty non-stereotypical way, but is still an expression of that gift, right? Um, so I just, I was doing an interview the other day and I was just thinking about um, somebody had asked about that. And I, I was saying, you know, there might be somebody who's like having company over um, that they know really well and they know what their favorite cookie is. Like one woman might be like, I will bake those cookies. And the other woman will be like, I will go to the store and buy those yep. cookies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Like <Store. laughs> they're both beautiful expressions. Yeah. They're both beautiful expressions of like a feminine uh, attentiveness mm-hmm. to the needs of others. Example. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, and it's okay that they yeah. weren't homemade. Right? But, and it couldn't, it might not be cookies. It might be, you know, their favorite right. mixed drink or whatever. I don't care what it is. Right. But there's still an attentiveness too, like, to that even, person. Even you have like these men who are like the cookers or the bakers of the family and that's their like mm-hmm. natural inclination to like provide, you know, for the, like it just because it yeah. doesn't stereotypically yep. fit. There is that like 
what you live mm-hmm. from is coming out. Sorry, I don't provide like that. Yes. You don't provide with cooking. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. You but make really good scrambled eggs. That's such a great way to put it. Like that's <laughs> lies. <laughs> My husband made scrambled eggs for the kids tonight for dinner. <laughs> it's a it's it's a dad possible. Always yep. a win. Breakfast for dinner is always um, a win. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that though. That is that's such a perfect way to put it. Like that is an expression of providing, right? Like one of my one of my professors at the Augustine Institute um, at the end of class was talking about complementarity um, for some reason, and he was like, "I make all the food at our house." He's like, "I cook all the dinners," and I'm like, "Yeah," and that's like totally fine. Like that doesn't emasculate right, right. you, right? Where whereas some circles would argue that that's emasculating him by expecting him to make dinner or allowing right. him mm-hmm. to make dinner, and right. it's like, what? What? Yeah. what? That's not no. Go go throughout all of history right. and culture, and like. Nowhere in the Bible does it say the woman must love these skills and be good at them, right? Like, it, no, it's different, different expressions of it. Now, could that be cooking? Absolutely, it could be, but yes. it's not exclusive to, right. it's not essential, right? That's not an essential act yeah. that declares you a woman. Yeah, I think that's nail on the head is it's not these behaviors, it's these essences. It's where these, it's where our behaviors mm-hmm. are rooted in, um, where they find their mm-hmm. identity. Yeah, now, and I'm really excited to ask you this question because we don't have, Mm-hmm. Same experience you do, because our oldest, or sorry, our girl is only four, yeah, our daughter. and our daughter's only four. And I would love, I, I would really love to be able to mm-hmm. cultivate th- this uh, her feminine genius. And I know that we've been trying, um, but mm-hmm. do you have any tips on on how to do that well for daughters, so that that families can support them mm-hmm. and parents can support them as they kind of navigate through? Mm-hmm. Yes. So I think like affirming um, and finding ways for them to cultivate these gifts in ways that don't box it in and make them feel less than if they don't live them out in stereotypical ways, right? I'm not saying that like, oh, gender is just whatever you want it to be. But what I would say is that there's a really big playing field, right? The way that we express and live our masculinity or femininity. And all we have to do is look to the lives of the saints to see that. I think that's another great helpful point in understanding. You've got Joan of Arc the warrior, and you've got Therese of Lisieux, who's who's the cloister, right? Like two very different expressions of femininity. But you got to believe the way Joan was leading was from her feminine heart. The way she was leading those armies was not like a man. She was leading like a woman, right? And you got to believe that that Therese was, you know, in her convent, like with her missionary yeah. zeal coming from her feminine heart. She wasn't a, a ma- she wasn't um, a a monastic, like a man, mm. she was a monastic, like a woman, right? Like, so the way that you express that, right? So like finding those times and those places to, uh, to affirm that and to help them cultivate and grow in that and to model that, I think is one of the most important things, um, you know, and not shaming, um, our daughters if they don't fit that mold, um, in, in the sense of, um, Gosh, this is, it's, it's a hard one to kind of try to explain and talk about. Um, because I don't want someone to leave this conversation thinking that I'm saying like, well, actually, gender is right, nothing, right? right. right. <laughs> but at the same time, like, I have a daughter who like, uh, one of my daughters is just like, she's not a girly girl. She's not a right. tomboy either, right? But she plays football with her friends at the, um, at recess. You know, the other girls might be off chit chatting and I, I don't know what they're doing she doesn't know either I, <laughs> but she's out there she loves to play sports she loves to play soccer she loves to play football and i don't ever want her to think that well she's not feminine enough because she enjoys sports right like that's not essential to her femininity but i do want her to play sports in a way that um is true to who she is right so now if she starts like throwing punches at boys, then we were going to have a conversation, right? right. right? <laughs> like if the way that she's going to express her frustration and anger, you know, um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we're well, getting stereotypical no, here no, again, I right? Lo- so I love that because one of the things we, we like to do with, with the, um, with our podcast is hoping we're hoping that married couples can go and then take this conversation one by your book, but then have a conversation amongst themselves and, and how are they going to implement this? Um, we, so our daughter Gianna is sandwiched in between, uh, four boys. So she's got two older brothers and then two younger brothers. Um, so she does not play yeah. like, like what would be stereotypically a girly, girly girl. Um, 
However, she's mm-hmm. I I've seen those gifts come out, or her her she moves from from her feminine genius a lot, especially in the way she cares for her brothers. Mm-hmm. Though she's not the oldest, mm-hmm. she cares for her oldest brother. Like if if they need something, she gets it. Um, she's just oh, she's and she just can predict what that is. It's not like from request. It's like I'm mm-hmm. I'm seeing a pattern here. I'm seeing an, intuition. Yeah. So she's very perceptive. Like even. Yeah. You obviously just heard our dog, but we're, we're trying to set up ways of training her so she can ask to go out, which isn't crying like that. But, um, she was like, this isn't working, mommy. She's scared of it. And, and she was just able to pick up on like, there's something different here. And I just think it has, it's, I think one thing that's great about your book is that it goes beyond whatever the stereotypes might be. Like there's, there's something that's much mm-hmm. greater that's in, that's in there that I really think that, um, our listeners can benefit from. <laughs> From reading and then implementing into their marriages, but also into how they parent, into how they they saw themselves growing up, and how they can continue to heal through that. If if it wasn't, you know, if they weren't given catechesis and and a, you know a faith that that was able to support them in the way they were hoping. Yeah, it's so much deeper and richer than the surface level that we get from society. Like when you really understand the giftedness of each gender and, and what they the uniqueness that, that they bring to the world, like it's. It's just fathoms deeper than than what we've been given. Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, I think I think this is a good place to, to end. Um, yeah. And sorry, can we just show that? Sure. I don't know if we're gonna use the video still. If people see, if you if you watch up to this point and we did use the video, you're welcome. But we don't know if we're gonna do that. Um, but the book is Reveal the Gift. Um, by. Lisa Cotter. Um, thank you so much for just being on having this conversation with us. Thank you for your patience with our yeah. all the different things that we had come up. <laughs> oh, it was nothing. It was nothing. Don't you worry. I love it. I love real life. I love real life podcasts where you do feel like, oh, I popped into the living room this afternoon or, you know, like that's that's more authentic to me than the like everything was perfectly polished. Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at, well, the book is at ascensionpress.com slash reveal the gift. And then I'm also on Instagram at Lisa Ann Cotter and with no E. And I have a website. It's made to magnify.com. I don't really update it, but if um, you want you want to connect with me there, there's a way to connect with me there as well. Beautiful. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so we'll put those all in the show notes as well, just in case. And um, Lisa, thank you so much for, for joining us. We really appreciate it. And um our listeners, if you have any follow-up questions, we would love to uh, we would love to dialogue about the feminine genius and how we've seen it in, in marriage, and um, and we'd love to help you connect with Lisa as well if you have any follow-up questions or comments. And um, yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna pause recording and then we'll we'll follow up with you in a second, but um, just so they don't have the banter at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for listening. We're so glad you're joining us. Please be sure to check out Lisa Cotter's new book, Reveal the Gift, available through Ascension Press or on Amazon. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and leave us a review. We're so grateful for your encouragement and ask that you prayerfully consider becoming a podcast patron. Your financial support can help us keep projects like this podcast going. We'd also love to connect on Instagram at to become family. Let us know what you would ask if you had pre cana with the Pope. See you at the next episode.